All right, the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a really important New Testament book uh, in reference to the church itself and what the church is. You know, we're studying church history in the uh, book of Acts about the beginning of the church. Well, Ephesians will play right into that. You know, and that's the great thing about the Bible. And I've, I've, over the years, over 30 years now of teaching the Bible, I could be in Genesis or I could be in Revelation and find verses that connect. And then if I just jump over to Jeremiah, I'll find another verse that connects. Because it's all one book, it comes down to it. Uh, Ephesians is important because it tells us the, about the mystery of the church. And the church as a mystery. The word mystery in the Bible uh, refers to a, an unknown truth. Right? Something that is revealed. The truth that's revealed. And the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, the church was a mystery. So, this is important for understanding the Bible. Not just understanding the book of Ephesians, or not just understanding the church itself, but you think about how important that is. If the church is not mentioned in the Old Testament, then there are no prophecies concerning the church in the Old Testament. There are no doctrines for the church in the Old Testament. It is an unrevealed truth. And even Paul talks about that I didn't learn this from anybody else. I learned this from the Holy Spirit. And the reason he learned from the Holy Spirit is because there were no Old Testament books that would give him the information about the church itself. That means when we go to Acts chapter 2, talking about the church and Peter preaching from Joel, if the church is a mystery in the Old Testament and Peter preaches from Joel, then the church is still a mystery from in the book of Joel. Right? So in Joel's day, did he think it meant the church? No. Did later on it become the church? No. The scriptures don't change over the years. If it meant that, uh, uh, if it wasn't the church in Joel, it's not the church in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preached from Joel. It doesn't change the truth. That helps us to understand, it helps us to rightly divide the word of truth. It helps us to understand that, uh, like the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon is not a picture of the church, not a picture of Jesus. So when it talks about the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon, it's not talking about Jesus. In fact, it's not even talking about the man. It's talking about the woman. The woman is the rose of Sharon. Come on. Between Levi and Lucy, which one's a rose and which one's a thorn? <laughs> See, you knew already. You knew where that was going. So the rose is not talking about the woman. We, in, in the book of uh, Song of Solomon, it's not talking about the church because the church was a mystery. Nowhere in the Old Testament we find the church. No books allude to it. The church in the book, or the book of Ephesians gives us symbols of the church. Uh, it helps us to understand the church better. The church as a body. We talk about the body of Christ in the church. Uh, you know, the building we go to to have church in is truly, actually not the church. Right? The church is the body of Christ. Uh, we have church building. I'm, it's not wrong to call it a church by any means. It's fine. Uh, but what I'm saying is that that building is not what makes it the church. Because there's a lot of so-called churches out there that are not the church. You know, the Catholic church is not the church. Uh, it is not even biblical in any way whatsoever. Uh, the body, or the church, is likened to a temple. I'm talking about the ministry that we have. Uh, it's a mystery, like I said a while ago. Uh, unrevealed truth, not found until the New Testament begins. Even when we go back to Matthew 16, and Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he asks Peter, who do men say that I am? And he says, well, thou art the Christ. And then he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Do you think Peter knew what that meant? No. He didn't know about the church. He, he heard the word church, which means called out assembly. All Jesus said to him really was, upon this rock, he said, upon myself, he said, I will build an assembly. Well, Peter probably already thought that came to pass. Where your disciples were in assembly. So he didn't know about the church. He didn't know about the doctrines of the church. He didn't know about water baptism in the church. He knew about water baptism because John had been doing it. 
But he didn't know about the doctrine of church or communion or the Lord's table or anything like that. All he knew was that Jesus said, in the future, I want to have a group that come together. And this group, he said, uh, will, will be a, a, an assembly that I'll call out together. Well, in Acts chapter 2, even when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, they still didn't know anything about the church. The church began unknown to them. Just like when you got saved, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, unknown to you. And later on, as Acts progresses, they, they start these different assemblies, and then they realize, you know what? This is, a, this is what uh, Jesus was talking about. When these people, these 3,000 people from all over the known world at the time, gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and they heard Peter preach, after they heard him preach, what did they then do? Dispersed. They dispersed and went home. They went home to Ethiopia or they went home to uh, wherever uh, throughout the known world. Had. And when they got home, what they did? They spread. They spread and started churches. They started assemblies. They went back and told their family that wasn't able to come. This is what happened. That we've been looking for the Messiah for years. Guess what? He came. And this is what happened to him. They crucified him. He resurrected. He ascended up into heaven. And then they started their different organizations, different buildings of uh, people meeting together. That became the early church. So it was a progressive. It didn't all happen at one time. The church is like to a new man. You know, they, we come to know Jesus Christ. They, we're, the old man passed away. Behold, all things become new. The church has a bride. We now know that we have a special relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Whereas the Old Testament Jews were the bride of Jehovah. Now we are the bride of Christ. And the, the church is a soldier. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 says that we're to put on what? The whole armor of God. Why do you put on armor? There's war. There's going to be a fight coming. You get saved and everything's not going to be simple and easy. You're in a war. You're in a battle. You know, uh, a lot of times in our hymn books, some of our hymns will refer to Canaan as a picture of heaven. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Makes it sound like Canaan is a great place. When Joshua and the children of Israel went into Canaan, what did they have to do? They had to fight. Fight. <laughs> fight. They had to prepare yeah. for battle. That's why part of the wilderness journey was to prepare them for battle when it went in. So Canaan's not a picture of heaven. Canaan, if anything, is a picture of the Christian life. The life that you, after you get saved. Because now you put on the whole armor of God. You've got to prepare yourself for battle. So very important we see that the church is likened to a soldier. We've got to prepare ourselves. Ephesians emphasizes the body of Christ, which is the church, the true church. We say the Catholic church is not the true church. New Hope Baptist Church is not the church itself. We, we have the church there. The church meets there. Those who are saved. I wish it was something you could tell me because I have a, well, she's not my biological daughter, but she's my husband's daughter. And she's, she was brought up in the Catholic Church. And when we talk, sometimes I have to tell her that, you know, that's a man-made church. She said, but I believe in Jesus Christ. I said, well, that's good. Yeah. And I have accepted And I said, and that's good because, and then I remember what, what, what you taught in class about when Jesus sent the disciples out and, he, and they said that they saw uh, other people, but they were still teaching in your name and they rebuked them because they were not of them. Right. And he said, no, no, no. He said, because if they're not against us, they're for us. Yeah. So that made me think about the Catholic Church. If they are believing in Jesus Christ and, 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 and right. accepting Christ as their Lord. Yeah, if, if somebody accepts Christ in the Catholic Church, are they saved? Yes. Yeah. Now, does the Catholic Church teach the way of salvation as a whole? No. But can you hear the gospel in there sometimes? Yes, you can. Sometimes you can. So people can get saved in the Catholic Church, or any church for that matter, uh, because it's not the church that saves. It's the Word of God. When people hear the Word of God in whatever manner they hear it in, and they accept Jesus as Savior, then that's not going to change as your, of your location. But are they where they need to be? No. Are they going to be babes in Christ all their life? Yes. Now, as far as being a priest, I don't believe they're saved. Because they know their, their doctrine. They know that 
it's not Jesus Christ. In their minds, the Catholic Church doesn't teach salvation by grace. Now, the average church member, though, has no clue what they really believe, the church itself. So if they accept Christ, they're saved. That's not going to change. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but the higher you get up in the Catholic Church, and obviously you're not saved because you believe things that are completely contrary to the Scripture. You believe that Mary is the way of salvation, not Jesus. Now, but most Catholics, they don't know that. They're ignorant, just like most Baptists don't know what they believe either. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, Dr. K, I think we we're gonna have to one day be accountable. For we are that. accountable. Yeah. Yeah. We we you just gotta yeah. you know search yourself. We're gonna yeah. be held accountable. Ignorance for that. is no excuse. That's right. And we have our, there's more opportunity today that's ever been in history yes. for knowing the Word of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much more accountable are we than mm -hmm. the people who lived in 500 that didn't have their own Bible? Yeah, we have responsibility. Ephesians emphasizes the body of Christ, the church, whereas Colossians emphasizes the head of the body, which, of course, is Jesus. So that's why these two books are really important to, together to get uh, understanding. Why? There's so many different books in the New Testament. It gives us a full picture. Ephesus uh, is the only New Testament church to receive a letter from more than one Bible writer. How many books of the Bible were sent to Ephesus? How many books of the Bible were what? Were, had the uh, church at Ephesus. Were sent to church at Ephesus. I don't understand the question. Uh, Dr. K, I'm sorry. It's like uh, the, thing, the church at uh, Corinth. How many letters were written to the church at Corinth? Uh, two. Two. Mm -hmm. First thing. How many were written to Ephesus? One. More than that. Yeah. Okay. There's four. Okay. Four that were written to Ephesus. Okay. Ephesians obviously is one. What other? Who was writing the book of Revelation you're written to? John. Oh, John. It was written by John, but who's written to? To seven different churches. The churches. And name one of those seven churches. Ephesus. Yeah, Ephesus. Yeah, uh -huh. okay. So that book was yes. written. Mm -hmm. And then there's two more books that was written to Ephesus. Who was the pastor? Oh. Timothy. Paul. Oh. Timothy. And so Timothy was the pastor. Uh -huh. And so first and second Timothy were written to Ephesus oh, as well. Okay, now. So in that but regard, yeah, now, yeah. yeah, there actually were four books yeah. that were directed to initially to the church at Ephesus. Okay. Four but, different books. Yeah. Uh, that, that was initially written. Yeah, okay. Because remember, the books of the Bible are what we call cyclical books. Cyclical, C Y C L I C A L, a cycle. Uh, yeah. Uh, meaning that the ch book of Ephesus was sent to the church of Ephesus, and then what happened? It got sent to Colossians. It got sent to Colossae, then that, it got sent. So basically, they would eventually all get all the books. books. But they were sent from one to the other. Okay. Okay. That's why the New Testament talks about uh, the epistle from Laodicea. What epistle was that? Laodicea. Now, that was one of the. That was one of the uh, uh, ones in in uh, Revelation. Well, there were actually yeah. churches mentioned there. But not, it probably wasn't that one because it's uh -huh. written before. Okay. But it's, it's like this. All right, this is, I write my epistle down here. Okay. All right? And I send my epistle to Levi. So now that is the epistle to Levi. Okay. He gets through with it. And Levi, it was the epistle from Doug to Levi. Levi gets done with it and he sends it over to Sandra. So what epistle is it now? The epistle from who? From Levi. From Levi. Okay. And then you send it. To Priscilla, now it's the epistle from Sandra. Oh, okay. So okay. then, is the one that sends it. Is the one who sent it to them. So the one layout from Laodicea could have been a book of Ephesians, could have been whatever. We don't know, but it didn't come from. The, it's not mentioned from the original church. Where'd you get the letter from? Well, we got from Laodicea. Oh, I think that's the one I got from Ephesus. 
And where'd you get? So we, they, because remember, the books of the Bible are, weren't named in the Bible. When Paul wrote First Corinthians, you think he wrote First Corinthians on top of it? No, no, he didn't write that. They didn't write. Colossians, or they didn't write Ephesians. Those were not biblical names of books. Those were added later on. Right? That's why uh, uh, John, a lot of times in your Bible, the book of Revelation says uh, uh, the revelation of, of uh, John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Or not John the Baptist, the revelation of John. John yeah. uh, no, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But some will say that. Some will say in Hebrews... Underneath Hebrews, it will say Paul, the epistle of Paul. He didn't write it. That was added later on. They could be right, and they are helpful, but they can be confusing. But Dr. King, I wanted to make this point. That's why I like being in class. So you can ask questions if you don't understand something. Right. It does absolutely help to be in class. Yes, sir, it does. All right, the church here uh, was founded by Paul during his second missionary journey. He was there with Aquila and Priscilla. I know. <laughs> you didn't tell us about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think you said your husband's name was Aquila, though, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> What were their occupations? Uh, they were the uh, purple. They did with de- no. dealt with the purple. No, that was Lydia. That was Lydia. Tent builders. Tent builders. Tent builders. Tent builders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Remember uh, when the ministry wouldn't pay Paul, even though he deserved to be paid? Mm-hmm. He made tents. He worked with Quill and Priscilla and making tents for a while. Uh, he stayed at Ephesus for a very short time. He promised to return back to them. Aquila and Priscilla stayed behind to help Apollos. Apollos got saved, but he didn't. He got saved before much news of the church and what was going on. And so his ministry more was the ministry of John the Baptist. And so he needed an instructor, and God allowed Aquila and Priscilla to stay behind to instruct him in the truth. And uh, Dr. K didn't. Um Aquila and Priscilla uh, helped Paul financially when they could. I'm, I'm sure they did, yes. Again, important to note that the importance of human uh, leadership. Now, I know the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher. Uh, First John tells us we have an unction from the Holy One or an anointing from the Holy One, and it teaches us all things that are true. Um, but God uses people. Right? So yes, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. The Holy Spirit should, needs to be the teacher in here. I, I'm the instructor right now. I'm the teacher right now. But ultimately, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why it's so important that you listen to people that teach the truth. And I do believe I teach the truth of the Word of God. And if I teach something that's contrary to it, the Holy Spirit will warn you about that. Mm-hmm. But... If you're not willing to listen, <laughs> yes. then you, you can end up with false doctrine. Amen. That's why it's so important that we think about why we believe what we believe. Uh, I don't want to accept everything that I hear without checking it out. You know, look it up. I hear all things all the time about what's going on in this country and think, oh man, I can't believe they did that. And I look it up and think, oh, I, they didn't do that. You know, well, this group says this. Oh, really? Wait a minute, that's not what they said. Look it up. When it comes to the Bible, look it up. You know, and it, it is important. And, and like I say, praise the Lord, we have opportunity today through different media, whether in class or video or what have you, of, of learning the Word of God. On his third missionary journey, you know, remember he started on the second, now on the third, ends up staying there for three years. Ephesus here is in modern-day Turkey today, southern Turkey. 
which I'm sadly to say is a Muslim nation today. The church is not really prospering there. It was the center of Christianity all through there. Over to Rome, which would have been way over here, I guess. But uh, throughout the Ephesus, the seven churches of Asia Minor, the book of Revelation, were all located within Turkey, uh, over in what's now Iraq and Iran, that the church was uh, prosperous there. Uh, and over the years, they kicked the church out. The church went to other countries, and now they're kicking it out in other countries. Oh, I didn't know Georgia had a Georgia church. Uh, Georgia actually is a, um, south, it's, a, it's still a country today, but it's south of Russia. It's actually, uh, it was in the Soviet Union at one time. That's not Atlanta, though. <laughs> <laughs> Two of Paul's greatest prayers are found in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are not to pray other people's prayers, but we are to use uh, biblical examples of prayer in our life. So that's why you know, the model of prayer in Matthew 6, uh, we call it the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer, model prayer, what have you. We're not just to repeat that those verses and claim that as a prayer because just saying the words is not enough. We have to pray it from the heart. But we are to use the Bible examples on how to pray. Matthew 6 was an example. Remember, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so he begins to do that. We look at Paul's prayer, and while we can't just read the verses and that being make it a prayer, but the things that he prays for, we can pray for other people and know that it's biblical. Right? Remember, prayer is only going to be effective if it's scriptural. If it's not scriptural, it's not going to be effective. It's, it's just not going to be. You know, it's like some guy praying that uh, uh, his wife would leave him so he can marry somebody else's wife. He can pray that all he wants to, and that is not a biblical prayer. And God is not going to answer that. He might answer it himself and do wrong, but God's not going to answer that. And we see here... Right, uh, for this cause... Uh, Fix this. It's not showing on the verse tag. Wrong here. Let me just read it to you. Come up here. But uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 18, it says, Wherefore I also. After I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks to you, making mention of my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, gives unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Ephesians 3, what, what did you say? I'll put it up here. Ephesians 1, it's uh, 15 through 18. Yeah. So that's a good one in Ephesians 3, set, uh, uh, 17 through 19. Right, right, we'll get there. That's part of that. Oh, Ephesians okay. 14. Yeah. I, was gonna say, I, just, I had that highlighted in my Bible. Okay. Oh, okay. Here's the first one. Okay. It says, Wherefore I, I also, after I heard of your faith in Lord Jesus and love and all things, cease not to give thanks to you, making mention of my prayers. If you don't know somebody very well, you can still pray for them. You pray this prayer, the, the content of it. It says, uh, I heard, you know somebody's of their faith. What can we pray for, any, for anybody? Well, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. So you can pray for someone to, to know more of God through God's Word. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, my prayer for the students, all students, is that they understand the Word of God. Well, that's what he's saying. That your understanding being enlightened, uh, we use the word illuminate. The Holy Spirit illuminates God's Word. And you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. So, 
what, what a great prayer we could pray for, for everybody. Pray this prayer for, for your pastor. I mean, how important it is for him to make sure that he's teach, preaching the truth. You pray for him to do that. Pray for yourself to do that. And then uh, 14 through 21, but I'd say 17 through 19 is within there. Uh, and I'll just read 17 through 19. Well, no, let me go back. Okay. He said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, uh, that he would grant you, according to his riches and glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And I think sometimes we pray, and I sometimes I found myself praying sometimes and thinking, well, that's a pretty big prayer. I don't know if, you know if I should pray that or not. Well, God can ask well, above, above what I even think I can pray. So we can pray anything as long as it's according to the Scripture and know that God does hear us. He doesn't always give us what we want, so you're not guaranteed that. But if you pray according to God's will, God does answer those prayers. And then the church is likened to a body, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And we are the body of Christ. I don't know how God, this picks up on the video screen there. Uh, but as far as this image here of Jesus, that all these people inside that body, we're all in the body. We're not all the same parts of the body, though. Right? Some might be an eye, some might be a hand, some might be a foot, some might be what have you. We're all different parts of the body of Christ and all have different functions. If everything was the eye, we'd be in trouble. Right? That's why God has chosen you to a ministry, whatever it is that He's already called you to, and He equips you to do that ministry whatever it might be. And like I say, not everybody's going to do the same thing. Creation of the body planned by God the Father. The church wasn't an afterthought that God came up with after the Jews rejected him. It was planned from the foundation of the earth before God uh, created the earth. He already knew about this. Somebody once said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? God doesn't have to think of anything. He doesn't have to come up with a new plan. You hear people say that Jesus will come back when the Lord decides. Well, that's not a true statement. He'll come back from what God's already said is going to happen. Uh, it, whatever time it's going to be is what it's going to be. It's not, he's not waiting to figure it out. Should I do it now? Should I do it now? No, it has been decided. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The creation of the body of Christ was planned by God the Father. He elected us. This is where people get greatly confused as to what election is. Some say that we are elected, meaning that they believe, wrongfully, that God, before the foundation of the earth, has chosen certain people to heaven and he's chosen others to hell. And you have been elected by God, whatever it might be. That God has called us, and if you're called, you're going to heaven. And there's nothing you could do about it. Or you're going to hell and there's nothing to do about it. So that negates prayer. Because if everything's going to happen, it's going to happen. Then why pray? What's the purpose of it? Uh, is it fair 
for God just to choose you to hell and somebody else to heaven. No, that doesn't sound fair to me. It doesn't sound right. So why does some go to hell and some go to heaven? Well, like I say, according to the scriptures, those go to hell by choice. And those go to heaven by choice just by accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. And God does more than enough to every single person in the world for them to, to get saved. But He leaves it up to them. The purpose, Ephesians 1, 4, we should be holy and without blame before Him. Before the foundation of the world, He, he pre, we were predestined. And we'll look at that word here in a minute, but the word predestined. Predestined means to know before, to know ahead of time or something. Does that mean to cause it to happen? If you know something's going to happen, does that mean you caused it to happen? No. No. You just know. You just know. God knows what's going to happen. Does that mean He chose it to happen? No. It's like a you know, uh, precise hospital next month. Baby's going to be born there. That's going to happen. I didn't cause it to happen. But it's going to happen. I, it, God knows what's going to happen, but it doesn't mean He chose for it to happen. So, if somebody wants to reject him, God didn't make them reject him. You know, we talk about the sovereignty of God. and That's a phrase that people really misunderstand today. They say sovereignty of God means God's in control of everything. Well, God is in control of everything, yes. But, does God always get his way? No. Well, if God doesn't always get his way, why should you? You know, sometimes we think we should. We deserve it. Well, God doesn't always get what he wants. God wants everybody to be saved. How do I know that? That's what Scripture tells us. It's His will. We know that. Is everybody saved? No. no. So obviously God doesn't get His what? Uh, you know, the, the Calvinists are the ones who say He chose certain people to heaven, certain people to hell. Well, what He chose here before the foundation of the world wasn't for them to be saved, but that those who get saved would be what? Should be holy and without blame before Him. Are you always holy? Are no, we? Yeah. Not Does Scripture tell us uh, in Leviticus and in First Peter that we should be holy? If God has to tell you that you should be holy, that means what? You can be. You can be, but it also means you might not be. Because if we always were, then He wouldn't tell us to be holy. He would say, you are holy. But He says, no, you be holy. It's a choice we make. So all those before the foundation world, God knew that all those in the future who get saved, what do I want of those people once they get saved? I want them to be holy without blame before Him. That's what I want. Is, are you always holy and without blame? No. I wish I was. Dr. K, what did you say the word predestined means? What to know before. To know something before. Okay. Thank you. Here's the word predestinated. The method is through Jesus Christ choosing us to choosing all of us to choose salvation, but not always getting all that he wants. The method's through Jesus, but the base is according to the good pleasure of his will. And the reason to the praise of the glory of his grace, where he hath made us accepted in the beloved. God knew before that all those who get saved that he's required certain things in them. Four times in the New Testament, twice in Ephesians chapter 1 and twice in Romans chapter 8, we find the word predestined or predestinated. And you look up those four times, they can actually be divided into two different categories. One is job description, and the other is benefits. Job description is once a person gets saved, they've got a job to do. It'd be like you going out somewhere and looking for a job, and uh, you know, you still Walmart. Okay. When you went to Walmart, when they hired you, they set you down and told you two different things. One is, this is what we want you to do. And the other is, this is your benefits. Right? 
this is your job description. If you do this, then you won't want to, your benefits are you're going to get paid so much an hour, and I don't know if they have 401k or whatever, but you can get into this program you want. So they sit down there and clearly tell you what they expect of you. Well, predestination has to do with those two things. That once a person gets saved, there's certain benefits that we receive as a child of God. One of those benefits are that we are adopted. So God is telling us that you are adopted into the family of God. You have now become one of my children. Okay? Uh, one of those benefits is that uh, we are to live for Him. We're to, to serve Him. Work for Him. That's a job description. And the rest of the scripture gives us how we're to do that. And we'll look at these uh, four verses here in, in a minute. Or uh, later on. Salvation, first of all, of course, was purchased by Jesus Christ. All you have to do in order to get saved is believe God. Uh, you don't have to pray a prayer to get saved. Right? You don't have to pray a prayer. We do that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's, no prayer saves you. Right? In order to get saved, you believe God. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. So when you tell somebody, would you like to get saved? If they say yes, that means that they, they want to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So now they're saved. Uh, I always say that I got saved November 22nd, 1980, around 8 o'clock on Saturday uh, evening. But when did I truly get saved? Did I get saved when I walked, went forward? What, did I get saved when I was in the pew listening and knew that I needed Jesus Christ my Savior? Did I get saved the week before that? You know, it's when my mind, I accepted Jesus Christ. When I knew I needed a Savior. It might have been when I went for it. But if somebody raised their hand in church and said they want to get saved, they're saved. But if they truly want to get saved, then God in no wise will cast them out. And they will, you know, they, they've already come to a conclusion. I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus Christ as Savior. Now we go through a sinner's prayer with them to confirm to them that they understand exactly what they're doing, and it's good to do that. We need to know that we're sinners, and we need to know that we need a Savior. We need to know Jesus died for us. We need to know we can accept Him as our Savior. We we need to know all those things, and so somebody might be confused on how to get saved and not be saved. And so, yes, yeah, it's okay to confirm to them what the Bible says, but again, it's not a prayer that's going to save them. You remember I told you the story about the guy uh, called him Snow Camp in North Carolina there. And the preacher told him that you're saved because I went to a sinner's prayer with you. He's, he's no more saved than he was before he heard it. He turned it on. Because it's not listening to somebody say something. It's by you accepting Jesus Christ. So we are redeemed by His blood. And we gather together in his name. This is what the church is. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, we might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And here's the two categories of predestination to talk about. The job description and the benefits. The, the Greek word here, Prognosco is one of the Greek words for predestinate, or pro or redso uh, means uh, to determine beforehand. Now, it doesn't mean to determine salvation. It means to determine whether it's a job description or a benefit. You know, when, before Walmart hired you, they didn't, after they hired you, decide, okay, now we need to think of some benefits for them, and we need to find something for them. They already knew that before you got there. Right, they knew way ahead of time that down the line we're going to need somebody to do this and this is what we're going to pay. So when God determined beforehand, uh, before we were created, God had determined certain things concerning believers. Not in choosing believers, but concerning believers. Like I say, uh, before the foundation of the world, did God, after I get, got saved, did God have to come up with something for me to do? No, I already knew. Right. Uh, Ephesians uh, 4 talks about Jesus descending the earth, and when he ascended to heaven, he gave gifts to men. 
So the spiritual gift that I have, when did God give it to me? Before I was even born. I mean, God knew that way ahead of time. We don't have to ask God to come up with something for us to do. We just ask Him, what is it you want me to do? Here's the first category, the benefit of salvation. For predestined. Having predestinated us unto what? Having chosen... To, he knew before that what was going to happen... Before Levi, before Levi got saved, he knew before what was going to happen to you when, when you got saved. That you, first of all, you'd be adopted. We're an adoption of children by Jesus Christ Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. God knew before I got saved that once down the line, anybody and everybody's going to get saved, what's going to happen to them? First of all, they're going to be adopted in my family. So do, we are going to be, uh, He will be a father to us, we are His children. Benefit those who accept Jesus will be adopted. That's the benefit he's talking about. Here. So, how many of you here has anybody here been adopted? Yes. We all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you can know, think of human adoption, mm -hmm. but the fact is, we've all been adopted. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you're a child, if you're not adopted, you're in trouble. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Another benefit of salvation found in 111. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. How do we get it? Well, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So, what's the next benefit we receive? Those who get sick of Jesus will receive an inheritance. So, before I was even born, God chose for me and all those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior, that they're going to be adopted into the family of God and they're going to get an inheritance. In Romans chapter 8, gives us the next benefit of salvation. Remember, there's four times the word predestinated is used. So far, we've seen we're adopted, we've seen we receive inheritance, and the third benefit says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. Now, think about this verse here. Because the, the grammatical tense of this verse is it's past tense. All right. So God has said that you were called. Right. Just uh, how many people in the world were called? Everybody. Everybody. Right. If I would pick up my phone and I would dial Levi's number, and he looked down and saw that it was from me. That's a good thing about caller ID because you can just <laughs> decline it, right? Uh, does he have to answer that call? No. What if I call him a hundred times? Does he have to answer? Mm -hmm. No. And that's what happens to some people. God has called them, but they refuse to answer. Does that mean God didn't call? I mean, if you never answer the phone when I call, does that mean I haven't called you? No. No, I still call. Yes. But your choice whether to answer or not. But God says, we've been called... And whom he called, we've been justified. Remember what justification is. It's a legal action whereby God declares a sinner righteous. So you have been called, you have been declared righteous, whom he justified, then he also went that glorified. glorified. What is glorified? What happens when we are glorified? Be just like him. We're changed and we are we are received the perfect body. Has that happened? Not yet. Not yet. If it is, 
I, I, got, I got ripped off. I, I was in the wrong line or something. But God says He also has past tense glorified. What does that mean then? That means it's so guaranteed. You might as well say it already happened because it has, as far as God's concerned. There's nothing can change that. Now, so those who accept Jesus will be justified and glorified. We've been called justified and glorified. Those, those things pass. That's not me calling you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> now, question. What if someone goes down that hadn't been called? They have been called. But what if they haven't been called and they want to go? Maybe they felt a good feeling in church. And maybe the song made them feel good. You know how, how a song, the, the choir singing, and, and you get these little goosebumps, and you think, yeah. okay, I'm going down. And they uh, go down... They have been called. Okay, so they have been yeah, called. Yeah, because everybody's been called. Okay. The Holy Spirit convicts all of us. Okay. So now, does that mean they're going to get saved when they walk down the aisle? No. Right? Uh, I remember I was preaching several years back, and I gave the invitation, guy came forward. And so I went back to deal with him concerning salvation. And he said, when we got back here, he said that uh, I'm so-and-so, I'm um, the ex-husband of so-and-so who was in our church. And he says, do you think if I got saved that she'd get back together with me? And I said, well, I said, is that why you came down to get back together? He said, that's what I want. I said, well, did you come to get saved? He said, well, he said, I just thought if I did that, maybe we can get back together and she'll take me back. And I said, well, would you like to get saved? And he changed the subject again. So you, what I told him then was, I said, well, I know that you don't want to get saved. That's not where you're down to. Because if you want to get saved, that's what you're doing. You just want to get back together. So when you get serious and you want to accept Christ as Savior, call me. But I didn't tell him. I didn't go to the sinner's prayer. I didn't tell him that he was saved. I didn't tell him, we well, just accept Christ and we'll talk about this later. If he didn't want to do it, nothing I said was going to make him do it. Right? If he wanted to get saved, then he would have told me. He wouldn't have been more concerned about getting back with his ex-wife. Because that's all he wanted to do. He wanted to impress her. So, not everybody walks down the aisles and going to get saved. And you've seen people come to church for whatever reason, join the church, or whatever, and uh, three months later they're gone. And they're not in church at all. Why'd they come? Well, sometimes they come because uh, uh, a potential date. You know, it's a girl there, a guy there that they like. And they said they went to church for that. That's why I went to church. Really? Yeah, I went to church because the girl I was uh, engaged to. Uh, and I went there for her. She made you go to church. Yeah. And uh, after I got saved, I realized that I don't think she's saved. And she went there with her because the family went there. And they even sang gospel music. They had a group. We went up to other churches and sang all the time. I didn't know any of that until after I got saved. But that night I got saved, I went back to their house, and I was still excited about getting saved. And, I said, man, I just can't wait for Jesus to come back. And they, almost every single one of them said, well, we can. We've got too many things we need to do before then. And I, it's like, it's like popped my bubble. I mean, here I thought, man, get saved. Everybody wants Jesus to come back. Y'all want Jesus to come back? I thought, well, maybe something wrong with me. Well, as I, later on, looking back, I doubt very seriously if, if, if she was saved. I don't know if any other ones were or not, but I doubt very seriously. But I went for the wrong reasons, but fortunately... God convicted me, and it turned out to be a good thing. Well, so far with predestinated, we saw uh, adopted, an inheritance, and justified and glorified. Remember, there's only four times this word's used. So that means three out of the four are benefits. The fourth one is a job description. And that is, for whom he did predestinate, or he did foreknow, knew before, he also did predestinate that what should happen? That they should be conformed to the image of his son. So, before you got saved, God already determined what your benefits were. And he also determined what it is that I want you to do. And what is it that he wants to do? Be conformed to his son. That we need to be like him. And then we find out, how can I do that? How can I be like him? And that's why you have to go to the scripture yourself and live up to the scripture. Live according to that. Not according to what man may think or want, but what does the scripture say? 
So the great thing about predestination is three of them are benefits, and the only one is the job description. God says, do what I want you to do. And, and when you do that, you'll be adopted, you'll be, get inheritance, you will be glorified. There's these bodies that we have that every single one of us is uh, going to complain about. I mean, our bodies are failing us. It's just the way life is. It's when they're going to lose them eventually. But one day I'm going to get a new body that's going to be perfect. It's not going to have any uh, heart issues or any pain issues of anything whatsoever. And I'm okay with that. That's the glorified body. Yeah, that's, that's the glorified body. And God had, has guaranteed and told me already in His Word that's going to happen. So you can't change it. I can't change it. He won't change it. All right, let's close. Uh, take a break.